is Brother Assad, and I am back. And I'm back with a very, very, very special interview. I'm so excited about this interview with Dr. Uh, Sasha Balala. She is a, a former rear admiral, a former politician, but more importantly, she is an expert on Africa pre-colonization. And um, we don't want to take up too much time. We want to just jump into this, 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 this discussion. So, uh, Doctor, I, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you again. For, for, for joining this discussion. Um, I have a few questions, if you don't mind. I, but I know you would want to, probably want to start off giving some acknowledgement to the ancestors. So I'll let you, I'll let you take that. Thank you, Asad, you know me well. Yes, I normally say to people, the knowledge is not mine. It is given to me, I'm not extra intelligent, extra special. I just allowed myself to be the channel that they are always looking for, for the true messages of the past to come to the fore, because from 632, around 632, when Kemet fell and then renamed Egypt, fell to the Arabs, we've never really been ourselves in this continent. And there's been so much disinformation and misinformation that the ancestors are always looking for a channel to just, you know, put the right perspective. So that's what I allowed myself to be. So yeah, I acknowledge them um, from Cape to Cairo. Um, I also acknowledge those of the place. We call them Amato Zendao because where I'm sitting right now has got its own ancestors. It was somebody else's land before it was taken over and chiseled into what is called Johannesburg or Gauteng or South Africa today. But also just more so my own, my mother's uh, Abu Lamini, Zlugula Zedle Zagwa Lobamba, is it is bad as best bad Lubulisa, Bonabala Lil Pondu in Lenya, Tibendela Benya, Tinba Deba Balegela, a Malang in Lang I think Lemia Mesabema Finila, and also my paternal, the Lichfields, and all the associated sinnings that they um, <sighs> hooked with uh, or associated with. Yeah, that being out of the way, we can begin. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. And we, I want to acknowledge my ancestors, those who came before us. Um, you know, we come from descendants of slaves, so I can't call their names, but I can call their, their energy, you know. Um, so let me ask you this. So let's start locally. What was South Africa, the area that is now known as South Africa, like pre-colonial pre-colonialism? Who was here? What was the culture like? It's a very loaded question because normally when I say pre-colonially, I truly just want to go back as far as what is called before the common era, um, Christians say before Christ, they say uh, uh, BC, we say BCE. Um, and then some people, when they say pre-colonially, they mean as recent as like your 1800s. So South Africa is a very contested issue currently, um, archeologically and anthropologically because there's this myth of the empty land thing that Africaners coined when they came here because they didn't want to acknowledge that they have grabbed the land or stolen the land. So they came and we were taught that at school officially, by the way. They concocted this oh. notion that there were tracts of very empty land um, that they found unoccupied and that tied in with the scientific racism. You know, this era of scientific racism tied in with the scientific racism, mm -hmm. anthropology and archaeology that says uh, we came the Bantu migration of one CE, Christian say AD Anatomina. They say we came from around the East or the West and, and we came down here. So the two sort of married each other. But I think that the truth is always the truth and cannot be denied because we have a place here in Gauteng called the cradle of humankind. And if you go and you look at the fossils, I mean, the oldest is over 3 million years ago. And 
Gauteng mm. his history itself officially on the website. It's so ancient. I mean, it predates this one AD that they talked to us about. And then there's a civilization that was found uh, in Mumalanga um, by a white guy called it Adam's calendar. I suppose in his mind, uh, the furthest thing you could think of was Adam. But I mean, Adam is a yesterday story for the African people because we are the first race on earth. And we predate the mm. other two by, by millennia, really. So he called it Adam's calendar, but the elders came together and they knew and remembered the stories from their elders that it is in Zaloilanga, the place of the rising sun. And it is perpetrated of, obviously, archaeology, anthropology, uh, they deny it. But it's perpetrated, and, and, and this white guy himself, Tillinger, argued that it's around 200,000 years old. And he didn't just come with the figure. He invited other scientists to come and look, but it's still contested. They refuse to accept that it is that old. Because when they accept it is that old and it was a, an advanced civilization, truly there's even a, 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 st a calen stone calendar hedged onto the ground. Nogulunga actually comes from there. She can share a, a bit more about it. I still must go. Um, um, a stone calendar found there. And uh, if they look at the pictorial uh, uh, or the aerial view of it, you could see it had roads leading to what you currently call Botswana and stone roads. Um, and it was a stone civilization. So it, that's why I say South Africa is a contested because if you say what was here pre-colonially, somebody else will tell you, oh, it was empty tracts of land until the Africans arrived uh, migrating from the east they say we came through the West, the Congo, particularly through Mozambique and down here. So someone else will give you that answer. I don't want to believe that answer. I believe that if that band, and I'm still following this up, so your listeners must just be patient with me on this one. We can have another one when I've really, I'm still researching it and just waiting for my ancestors to reveal more. But my argument right now is, when the Bantu migration happened to come down here, and I say when and if, the people went coming to a place they didn't know. Because if you listen to it, what we call um, praise poetry or prose of particular surnames, the Shabalala one, for instance, uh, my in-laws, uh, it talks about a place in Kenya in Embo, but it says you went there twice. You know, you went and came, you went and came. That mm -hmm. tells me that when the so-called Bantu migration happened in 180, the people weren't coming to a place they didn't know because my argument currently is that life began here, which is why we have the cradle of humankind here. And obviously yeah. people wouldn't just stay here in such a large continent. They would migrate up, find the space, you know, curious what else is there. But yeah. when people start multiplying in the east or the west, wherever they were, obviously they will know that, okay, but there are tracts of land ancestors told us down there. So they won't be coming to an empty place where there was nobody, uh, for instance. So it's a history that needs to be thoroughly researched and I've put myself forward to do it. Uh, because even when you say you take Zulu, Kosa, and Bele, and Swati people, they're called the Nguni groups that tell you that they were Nguni before they were these four. But the history of that Nguni is so unavailable, it is not funny. Uh, even mm. the language, what was the Nguni language? Because if you look at the four of them, they are interrelated. Uh, I add the Zimbabwe and Debele to these Nguni groups because they left from Guazu anyway, so they are part of it. So there is a lot on South Africa that still needs to be unmasked uh, and put into proper perspective. But uh, yeah, if you say, how was this by the time white people came, um, 1652 uh, with the dromedaries, the Hude Wop, and I don't know what's the other third ship landed in the Cape, they found Kosa people there. They also found the Koi and the Sen. Now there's another disinformation and misinformation perpetuated by white people that want to put the Koi and the Sen people as non-African. Now they can't argue anymore about the empty land story. So now they found another decoy. Now they are trying to say the Koi and the Sen were not African. They were the first year, so the land is theirs. The land doesn't belong to Africans. 
then you find fools among the Koi and the Sen who buy this and are running with it and think that they really have some newfound information where they say the land was ours, but we are now, you know, sidelined. Uh, it doesn't belong to Africans. And I'm just like, but what were you? Because there are only three races on earth. You have the Mongoloid race, that's yellow people, the Caucasian, that's white. The Negroid, which is where the bastardized weight of Niga, you know, came from. The Negroid race, yeah. that's us Africans. So what were you? Because you were African. So, yeah, I think, um, Asad, I would allow you to give me a follow-up question. But, yeah, this is how South Africa was when they came. They found some people in the Cape. Uh, they already, they were, the Nguni had already diversified into Zulu and Swati. Swati was already there. Um, and the other, the other nation groups, uh, truly, you have the three Sutu groups, the Pedi, the Tswana, and the South Sutu, uh, the Lesotho, Lesotho. Our Tswana here are the same as the Tswana in Botswana. They were just cut uh, through colonial mm. borders. So are the Sutu. So are the Swati in Bumalanga. They are the, they are one people as the Swati in um, Eswatini today. Then you have the Tsonga and the, you have the Venda. Uh, the Tsonga people are amongst the oldest to have been here, by the way. I know that most people do not know this because during apartheid, they were the group that was mostly stereotyped, you know, um, and labeled but they actually are amongst the oldest um, in Ooh. Southern Africa. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for now. No, that was, that was a beautiful uh, rundown of that history. Uh, let me ask you then, said, in the beginning you said, you know, we could talk about, you know, the, the like the uh, colonializa colonial, uh, colonialization taking place in 1615, or we can actually go back to, pre-Christianity, pre-Islam, pre-the Judeo-Christian faith practices. So let's go back. So uh, we know that uh, Islam enters, what, 16, did you say 16? Six, six, 632, around 632. 632. Mm. Yeah, 632 AD, right? And they go in and they conquer Egypt. What is, okay, so we know a lot of us are familiar with Egypt, but what about the rest of Africa? What is taking place in maybe um, what is now Nigeria, or what is now Ethiopia, what is now even Southern Africa at that time? I always caution people and I say, the only reason we talk about Kemet, um, renamed Egypt, arrogantly mm -hmm. by the Arabs, is that it is the most recent of the ancient civilizations to collapse. Um, if people go and uh, read um, minutes, I call it minutes, really, um, of a UNESCO meeting of 1968, where Sheikh Anta Diop, the leading university in Senegal, is named after mm. him. He was Senegalese. May his soul rest in peace. Uh, mm -hmm. He was accompanied in that meeting by Obenga from the Congo, where he proved using linguistics and actually using Bantu languages uh, that Kemet was an African civilization. So the only reason we talk about it is it is the latest one to fall of the ancient ones, the ones that came from BCE. But Kemet didn't give birth to itself. I mean, civilizations and nations like human beings, if you find a baby, it was given birth to. It didn't fall from a tree. You right, know, right. Some, people, some people even have a saying, they say, you come from a womb. So are civilizations. Now for Kemet to just spring up uh, and in um, about three, 3,000 500, 350, yeah, 3,500 BCE, um, it doesn't make sense for us Africans because the racist archaeology and anthropology argues that the race that founded Kemet, which is what they said to Sheikh Antatiop in that meeting, was a white race, eh? light-skinned but not white, not European, and then somewhere dark skinned, but not African. I think they just, they can even invent zombies to a founded Kemet, stopping yeah. short of saying, yeah. yes, it was an African civilization. Yeah. 
But we know now that for Kemet to have been operating around uh, 3,500 BCE, we know mm. that Nubia was operating. They call right. it Tassetis Nubia or the, the Napta Playa Nubia. It was already operating and it was a, civil, a, 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 a high civilization around 11,000. So if you say 11,000 minus 3,500, you can see the time Nubia had to perfect her civilization. Yeah. And because they bordered, because Nubia is where Sudan is today. Because mm -hmm. Sudan bordered Kemet, we can already conclude that Nubia gave birth to Kemet. And I mean, people have studied this and countlessly have proved it. And then mm -hmm. we also know that at a certain, and oh, we also know that for Kemetians, the royalty, whenever they had to do their most sacred rituals, they went down south to Nubia. So why would, you, would they do that if they were not given birth by Nubia? Mm -hmm. But we also know that at a certain point, I think around 2000 or so, or, or, or a thousand or so, we can check the dates accurately, Kemet rises to colonize Nubia. But we also know that at a certain point, Nubia herself rises to colonize Kemet. Now, mm -hmm. that's the part where racist archaeology and racist anthropology speaks of Nubia, when Kemet colonizes them. And when they rise mm -hmm. to colonize Kemet, they call it the era of the Black Pharaohs. But we know mm -hmm. that Nubia is in there. And by the way, Nubia lived from those days until around 300 and something CE, what Christians call AD. Mm -hmm. From 11,000, that's the longest surviving kingdom in Africa. If we want mm -hmm. to truly find the, I call it the backbone or the skeleton of, of, of African culture, we need to look at Nubia. But it's hard to look at Nubia, Assad, because Arabs arrived in 632 CE, as I said, Kemet fell, for, fell first, renamed Egypt. Then they went and conquered Sudan. Now a travesty uh, has happened in that those northerners, the Arabs of Sudan, oppressed the southerners. We know the story through the 80s. They That started in the 60s. I mean, it's a war that finally, around 2011, they then ruled that the two countries must separate. I don't know where the AU was, you know, sleeping in Zulu. They say with Lama Finiela, you know, they were eating their own mucus. I truly do not know what the AU's problem is, but we know that it is not performing. Because they have allowed the Asapas, the land grabbers, the colonialists, to stay with the patent Sudan. Those are the northerners. Now, mm -hmm. Sudan Juba, I even prefer to call them Sudan Juba because it just, I choke, I have a lump in my throat for me to call them South Sudan. The originators mm -hmm. of the place are called geographically South Sudan and the Asapas in the north are called Sudan. So I prefer to call them Sudan Juba. So it's hard to actually now also unearth that whole Nubian civilization because like Kemet, it's now tainted with Arabization, with the North. For instance, when the separation happened, all the Nubian uh, pyramids have been left with North Sudan. They are not uh, in, in, in Juba Sudan, the originator. Mm. The sad thing for me is a lot of those um, um, pyramids were actually built by the Nubian queens. They had over a hundred years. I did say Nubia has been around from around 11,000 BCE. The end, mm. remember it was a countdown until around 300 CE. 300 CE starts on one up to 300. Now they are counting up. We are in CE ourselves. So you can see the amount of time that Nubia as a kingdom survived. Now, a lot of those kingdoms, there was a time over a hundred years of what is called the Kendake Queens. It was a matriarchal kingdom. A lot of those uh, pyramids were built during that time. Um, what was happening in the South, you have Great Zimbabwe. The architecture Zimbabwe. is the same as the architecture of the pyramid of B Giza. And it is the same as the architecture of uh, Inzalo Yelanga. 
you have in Southern Africa, I was looking at, at it yesterday, actually, over 4,000 of these ruins, stone-built uh, civilizations. You have these ruins all over the continent, by the way. I urge your readers to just go to Google and say, uh, traces of stone, stone ruins in Africa. You'll shock yourself to see how many there were because we are always presented as these people who built only with mud and dirt, you know? Yeah. So... Um, you have Mapungubwe, uh, there's a, a a rhino of gold that has survived, the statue that has survived from Mapungubwe would be today somewhere where Limpopo is in Southern Africa. You had the great empire of Shagazulu. Um, you had, yo, in the West, I don't even want to go. I think we can have a special session where we say, can we take all the kingdoms in the West? What mm -hmm. was it? What did it achieve? What is it known for? We can do the East, we can do the South because there's just so many of them. Uh, but I think it's important for me here to say um, Africa wasn't just kingdoms. You had nations, you had kingdoms, you had queendoms, you had confederations, like the Yoruba was a confederation because when they attack and conquer you they allow you to practice your culture your language everything you just know that uh, at, at an appointed time we bring the gifts to the yoruba uh, uh, king uh -huh. at the time so you had a variety of political systems it wasn't just one political system i mm -hmm. think the important thing to emphasize though is the equity that was in it because when you attack people and you enslave them, which is what happened, and that's how you find yourself in America as that, is, is what we describe as bonded slavery. It is not the same as someone mm -hmm. where you have a, a rule of war, for instance, I'm making an example, because all wars have rules, where you say, if you are conquered, we enslave you for two years, after the two years, you're okay. You know, that has happened with mankind or human beings wherever you go throughout this mm -hmm. uh, 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 globe or, or continent. So, yeah, you had a confederation, and I think a confederation was built on that principle, where you've been conquered, but they respected your culture, your, your, your ancestry, your uh, way of practicing uh, African spirituality, because it is not the same. It's another fallacy we need to squash. It is not the same. Perhaps it's the next topic we can go to from here. So yes, yes. Yeah, you, you had a variety of political systems. You had city-states, for instance. Uh, it wasn't just kingdoms. Okay, so so let's go there. We 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 know that um, like right now uh, there has been this this conserved effort by both Islamic the Islamic faith as well as Christianity to Christianize or Islamicize uh, Africa. What were some of the major kind of faith practices prior to the advent of Christianity and Islam? Uh, on the continent, and can, and, and second, a follow-up question is: Can we find connectivity between, uh, for instance, the Yoruba uh, Ifa tradition and maybe the Southern African um, traditions that may have existed? And well, can we find connectivity throughout the continent as it relates to these spiritual practices? Sure, we can. We can find connectivity, and we can also find. Um, um, varieties i call it creative application mm -hmm. um so islam is here around 632 ce uh, by for something they've really cemented you know taking most of uh, northern africa and then they are spreading to the west um they have time you can count from six these are centuries which is a hundred year period six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, eight centuries later in 1400, the first white people to set foot here are the Portuguese and the Spanish, and they are Catholic as Catholic can get. And they start fighting uh, over territory. And then the Pope calls them to order. So if a papal bull, it's 14 something. I We can check the accuracy of it also. Mm -hmm. But it is a 14 something papal bull and people can find it on Google where the Pope calls them in because it's not good for two Catholic nations to go to war over barbarians. And then the Pope rules Spain, you will take South America. That's why 
the majority of Southern American um, countries are Spanish speaking, and that's why Spain had a free reign there. So the Pope rules mm -hmm. will take South America, Portugal will take Africa, or Portugal ended up with two countries, Angola, Mozambique, and three islands, Sao Tome and Principe, Guinea-Bissau, and Cabo Verde. I don't know what they did. Maybe their power dwindled because then the British rose at the time also, and the French, and they were contesting for Africa more than any other place. So I suppose the power of Portugal was dwindling. So though the Pope had given uh, Africa to Portugal, uh, Portugal didn't really uh, amass as many colonies as in the end the English and the French did. The French themselves were Catholic, by the way, so the Pope favored them too. Um, so... 1400s they arrive. Now, you understand this. Eh? You have people who've been Islamized. Uh, now we are getting Europeans coming 1400 onwards. Now we are finding Europeans killing Africans and communities because now they are forced converting them from Islam to Christianity. Excuse me, you also find wars between Arabs and Christians over uh, territories that Europeans want now to wrestle from Arab rule. And when they wrestle, they want to Christianize those people. So truly, that's why I argue that, uh, and you can count, okay, that's 1400, let's do the century thing again, that's 14. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, or 20. We are now in what? Or oh, 21 years, that's 700 mm -hmm. years, plus the other 800 years. So you are sitting at what? About 14? 15, 14? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, about 14, 15. 15 yeah. Exactly. So, and that's that we have not been ourselves since. Um, mm. Especially because remember that white people didn't leave. We mutated from what I call classical colonialism, which is standing armies, colonial administrator, flying the flag of the colonizer. We migrated to enfranchisement, have your own flag, have your own anthem, you can vote, but you don't own the economy, nor the education system, nor the politics, nor any other system, as a matter of fact, because it's UN run. So that's why we call it neocolonialism, and the economic system is neoliberalism mm -hmm. or globalization another monster that we need to tackle for another day. So mm. we haven't been ourselves. So when we say African spirituality, what really do we, are we talking about? I, I think I want to upfront say there is so much bastardization um, of what is called African spirituality. It's actually said uh, in my country or in Southern Africa, I don't know in the other places, but I think it's the same because I've seen it in, in the West too. African spirituality has been reduced to consulting mediums, and that's regarded as the sum total of the spirituality. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's not even a fraction. That's like saying Christianity is going to church. Or for Catholics, that's like saying Catholicism is confessing your sins to a priest. That, that, that's what reduced mm -hmm. African spirituality to. The spirituality is far bigger than that. Um, there's something called cosmology, I think, which we, we need to understand for us to understand what we call African spirituality. So cosmology is normally how you came into being. So we would say cosmology in Christianity is creationism. Creationism of mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, and that's from whom everybody came. That creationism is important because the woman is taken out of the man. Now, my argument, having journeyed with spirituality is that, and religion actually, is that it's, Gender relations are always pronounced from the cosmology of those people. So if you look at Islam and Christianity, it couldn't have ordered any other gender relations other than ruthless patriarchal relations because in that cosmology, the woman comes out of the man. Sin enters the world through the woman. So the woman is tainted in a way, weak to sin. Um, you look at uh, Jesus is a male, God is a male, the disciples were males. Catholic Church, I mean, which is the first church on earth, all priests were male, two date women are not allowed to be priests. You look at Islam, the same patriarchy that you see. The important thing about cosmology in African spiritualities is that I've actually looked at over 50 of them, and I don't think I should do more. I think that's enough of a symbol for me. 
you scarcely find a cosmology where it speaks about how the people came into being. I'm defining cosmology again. You scarcely find one where one gender is subjected to the other gender, where one gender comes out of the other gender. Uh, look at the Zulu one, for instance, Zulu cosmology. They believe that, but they have been stripped from. That's why Zulu people, even when they say in proper Zulu, they don't say, where do you come from? They say, Utabugapi. Like, where were you? Utabuga. I'm trying to find an English word. You know, when you when you have maize, people who've seen a, a maize in, in the fields, when you harvest maize, you have to, it's like you are wrenching it from its stem. You know, we are, we are Ishugula. So Zulu people believe they came from the reeds. And it, they don't, nowhere does it say the male came before, the female came before, they just came to as human beings. Now, if mm. that's the cosmology, how then would you find Zulu culture as we see today, ruthlessly patriarchal? How do you migrate from that cosmology to have ordered gender relations that are so ruthlessly patriarchal? It simply means there is an interception of Christianity because it was really not Islam for us, it was Christianity. There's an interception of Christianity between the cosmology in its pure sense and what we find today as the belief system. So those cosmologies then are a variety, which is where we say there is a variety in terms of our spirituality. Some will tell you um, in their cosmology, they descended from the moon to people, or some will say uh, there was this uh, um, super human or spiritual being that gave birth to twins and these twins grew together and the twins were male or female. So that, that's one thing about our cosmologies. They are not rooted in patriarchy. That's the similarity between almost all mm. the cosmologies you find in this continent. And remember, mm. we are said to have over 4,000 languages. That's registered. It would mean there are as many cosmologies as over 4,000 in this continent. I dare someone mm. to come or find me a cosmology that says the woman came out of a man, like we find in the creation story. 